Hi, and welcome to the Fief Pro Podcast, Changing the Game. I'm Allie Riley. In this series, we'll be speaking to international female footballers about their personal journeys to success and find out what it's taken for them to reach the top of their game. And in celebration of the 30th anniversary of the FIFA Women's World Cup, we'll also be looking at how women's football has evolved over the last three decades and discuss what more needs to be done to protect the well-being of players and ensure that future generations can reach their full potential. Today, I'm talking with Janine Van Veek. A lot of people asked if you're born a leader or you made a leader, but for me, you choose to be a leader. And it comes with the situations and the challenges that you're faced with in that moment and how you deal with it. Janine is one of South Africa's all-time greatest football players. She debuted for her country's national women's team in 2005 and became their captain in 2013. With over 170 caps to her name, she holds the title of the most capped South African football player of all time. In recent years, Janine has played for clubs in the US, Denmark, and Scotland, but has now returned home to South Africa to play with JVWFC, the club she founded in 2013. In this episode, we'll be looking back at the Women's World Cup of 2019. Janine, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. I've been looking forward to this chat for a long time. I have so many questions and I think you have such a really, really inspirational and an interesting story with the South African national team. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm excited for the questions and to give you some answers. (laughs) Good. Well, Actually, 2019 has come up in in a lot of the interviews just because I think it set the bar as being a really big step forward for the women's game. I think we saw a lot of progress made. It was a symbol, I think, of how far things had come just generally with women's soccer. But for you and for your national team, it was also a very, very special tournament. What was it like walking out onto the field for that first game at the 2019 Women's World Cup in France? Wow. Well, the biggest moment definitely in my career, Um, something that I was working towards and waiting for for a very long time. I've been in the national team for 15 years and it was my first World Cup. So it was an extraordinary feeling qualifying for the World Cup. And there were just so many times that we failed to qualify for this major competition. And when it actually happened, you know, we were all, you know, so thrilled. And I mean, still get goosebumps talking about it today because that feeling was absolutely remarkable. But just walking out in the open, seeing so many fans in France, um, and then obviously the first game against Spain, we knew that it was a tough opponent. We were in a tough group against Germany and China. So we knew what we were up against, but I think it was just mainly making most of the experience and just showcasing the kind of talent that we have in South Africa, well, in Africa, because we were obviously uh, representing Africa as a continent. Um, But just being in that moment was, you know, amazing. And, um, yeah, we made the most of it and we got a couple of contracts abroad after that tournament. So it just shows you that, you know, even without a professional league that we don't have in our country at the moment, we are still able to qualify for major competitions and really set a mark in, in women's football, um, regardless of the results that we got. Um, I think, you know, people really enjoyed the display of football that the South Africans gave. What do you think was different this time around from the other qualifiers when you had come so close? Was was it just that's football or was there something different around the team or different players that helped you get that qualification? I think the major factor was preparation. The association started pumping more money. Sponsors came on board to help us with the preparation after we qualified for, for the World Cup. And um, obviously... Before then, you know, we knew that we were one of the top teams, top countries in Africa, and we had such a good team. We just lost out in the last World Cup in Canada. So we knew that it was in the bag for us if we just played our game. Um, and with the preparation that we got, that I think that was the turning point for us. Whereas before, you know, we would come in a, a month before a, a major competition like the African Women's Championship and then expected to, to win it or 
to qualify for the World Cup, which we always lost out on. So I think that was the major factor as to why we qualified. Why do you think there was a tension on your team in those years now, as opposed to in the past? I know that there was a very, very positive reception when you came home from the World Cup. But leading up to that, why do you think they invested more so that you would have more preparation? I think the federation enough, I think everyone real is starting to realize that I think women's football is probably the fastest growing sport in the world at the moment. Um, and they want to invest in their teams. They want to, I mean, they get a lot of money from FIFA um, to pump into the women's development. Um, so they kind of had like, you know, expected to pump money into to women's football. Um, and just by realizing that we're missing out on these major competitions inch by inch, there had to be that little bit of a difference that they, they could make in order for us to qualify. And the difference was getting us camps, getting us top opposition to play and no more low quality opposition for us to play, to challenge us. I mean, never in my career did I ever think that I would play against the U.S. national team in a friendly match and we played it twice. And, you know, we traveled to Japan. We played all these top quality teams that we would expect to play in the World Cup. And I think that made a difference. So from the association side, I think they saw that we always just miss out at that last straw and um, they needed to do something to make a difference. And uh, I think by them coming in to support us, the sponsors coming on board to to pump in money to women's football in South Africa, especially the national team, um, I think that helped us a lot. Yeah, it's so important and powerful from what you're saying. It's so clear that that investment. I mean, we talk about so many things that need to be better from salaries to standards, but really what you're saying, this preparation to have these games. And yes, of course, that needs to be backed financially by the association, but it made such a difference for you and the team. And then after, I think we've got to dive into how you mentioned that some of your teammates then got these contracts to play. And that, again, for countries like New Zealand, like South Africa, where we don't have a professional domestic league, you've got to be able to get your players out into these clubs. And that tied in with having that time together as a national team, because you've got to have both pieces, players being in top environments for 90% of of the year. And then that 10% about when you're actually together, those moments matter as well. So what were the clubs that players went to? I know you were in the NWSL. What doors did that open for you and your teammates? I mean, the major ones was obviously Tembi Hatlana that scored the opening goal against Spain. Um, she's playing currently in Spain, but she also worked her way up. She also played at the Houston Dash in the second year that I was there. Um, she then went to China after that. And, and then after the World Cup, got a, a contract in Spain and currently playing for Atletico Madrid. Um, we have Rafael Wajane, also a top quality player, and just waited for that window of the for the World Cup in order to to you know make her her name for herself. And she's currently playing in Italy, AC Milan. We have Linda playing in Sweden, um, a couple of players playing in Sweden and in Spain, um, and then there's a couple here and there playing you know in Europe as well. So I always say that. You know, people miss the African talent that we have, that we produce, is because we don't have the resources, we don't have the funding in order for our players to make a career out of what we love to do. And also the development side of things. We don't get the proper developments. If you go into Africa, you go into Nigeria, you come to South Africa, there are players that play on gravel and use, you know, tires as their cones. And they don't care. All they want to do is just play football and make it big. Um, so the, the development side of things in Africa is really difficult. So until you get to that level where you're being exposed at the highest level and people can recognize your talent. I mean, for instance, let's make an example of Barbara Banda, the Zambian that scored <laughs> hat-tricks against top teams. So no many one knew about her at all. I mean, I played with her for many years against her when she played Zambia. And until she made that, 
that moved to China and then obviously gained a lot of experience in her development and she comes and shines, you know, at the Olympics. Um, and it's great. It just shows you the talent that we have here in, in Africa and it's just not being recognized enough. But we have to, as players, we know that we need to qualify for major competitions in order to get recognized. Well, before we talk a little bit about what you personally are doing to contribute to this development of the women's game in South Africa, do you have a favorite off-field moment from 2019 or any memories that stick out to you with the team when you weren't actually playing games? What was the actual tournament and everything around it like for you? No, I think the vibe, I mean, obviously you get there and you're in absolute awe that you're actually there firstly um and just the vibe around the world cup the pictures being taken behind the scenes video clips being taken you know getting to meet top end quality players that you rub shoulders against um those are the small things that you take take away from this game you know it being in the chain room and that kind of atmosphere before the game starts and leading back to or reflecting back on like your career and how hard you have worked and everything just comes to mind in that moment. So there's not really anything particular that I take out from this tournament. It's just the whole experience of, you know, representing your country at the highest stage, at the highest level, a dream come true for myself or others. Um, that alone, I mean, playing against Germany, people that you you always used to just watch on TV all those years ago in the in the World Cups, and then you actually you know playing again, find yourself playing against that, and yeah, that's just off the field stuff and little things that you take from this game that makes it you know so worthwhile and so memorable. Well, you also we have to mention are the captain of the team. So what an amazing honor and and to be at this first World Cup with your team. How has your journey from when you first debuted for the national team to then being named captain to where you are now, what's that been like? If I know this is a loaded question, but just how has the culture of the team changed? What do you think you have brought to the team and where do you see the team going now? Well, look, I came into the national team in 2005. I was still a youngster and mm -hmm. It was all for me, even to this day, it's a, it's an honor and a privilege to represent your country um, and wearing that national team jersey. And, you know, back then you reflect back and you can see the growth of women's football over the years. And maybe it's not major, especially in South Africa, um, where women's football wasn't even on the radar yet in South Africa. No one even spoke about it. You were lucky if you got one little article in a newspaper about a woman's game or a female player. And so you can see that the woman's game has grown tremendously, you know, globally, not only here. But, um, you know, you played for nothing back in the day. You played for passion and love for the game. You didn't get a salary back then. And slowly over the years, things have changed. And, you know, the competition, the level of competition has changed. We brought in, you know, a, a structured league that wasn't really as structured back then. It was just people playing for the sake of it and in order to socialize. Um, so now it's become a structured semi-professional league that we have here that was launched last year. Um, I became captain in 2013 and yeah, I don't know how I've lost it actually because there's many challenges that I faced um, along the way, along the journey with my, some of my teammates because in South Africa you have 11 different languages that are spoken in South Africa and there's also multiple cultures around in South Africa. So there's always clash of heads and especially when you have females in one room uh, with different cultures, there's always a little bit of animosity going on. Um, so it's it's a little bit hard as a leader to control all of that and, you know, respect the, the religions and the cultures that you have to work with. Um, and, you know, being one of the only white girls, female white girls in, in this team, you know, has made it difficult, but I've gained a lot of respect from my teammates, from my colleagues, from players that I've played with and from the country um, because I've served my country for so long. And um, it's become a lot easier over the years, definitely for me. But because I had that drive and that passion, you know, to always uplift everyone else around me and just bring out the leadership qualities that I have and always you know, making sure that everyone is giving their best, including myself, um, and just, you know, 
showing the passion that I have for the game. And that has changed over the years and leading up. That's why I say that World Cup was life-changing moments for many of us um, because we all come from different backgrounds and, um, you know, players, including myself, that never thought that I would play at this highest stage and representing my country um, through football, a game that used to be seen as completely nothing to now being one of you know, the most spoken about sports in our country at the moment. Um, so, yeah, it's it's been amazing. It's been a long journey, some challenging moments. But without those challenges, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. I wouldn't be as strong as I am today. And I wouldn't have those leadership qualities that, you know, came my way in that moment in time. A lot of people ask if you're born a leader or you made a leader. But for me, you choose to be a leader. And it comes with the situations and the challenges that you are faced with in that moment and how you deal with it, you know, hands on and, and yeah, see what comes from it. So, so far, I've been doing good. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm thinking about the times that we've played or I don't know how many times we actually played each other in Cyprus, but I know we've been at the same tournament when we used to have th these dinners. This was so many years ago. But, you know, with New Zealand, we love to play the guitar, sing, do something as a team together. So every year, you know, we'd come and we'd have something prepared. And then your team would come and just blow <laughs> us out of the water every year. Well, like, yeah, everyone did love the South African vibe. I wouldn't love that. <laughs> It's just we have that kind of spirit in us. I mean, we, yes, we do. Yes. Even before the World Cup games, we used to sing in the tunnel and, you know, people would look at us funny, but that got us really pumped up. Uh, but just, and I think that's what brings all the culture that we have together as one. And it just works so well. It just works so well. Yeah, I was just going to say or ask if music and the singing and dancing was one way that everyone could come together yeah. because... When you're on that stage and definitely overshadowing the Kiwis, it looked like <laughs> definitely a, a, a great time and a bunch of friends just having fun. And I think that does, especially when when these tournaments are so important for so many different reasons. I love that that music and just something that's special to the team can really kind of you can forget your nerves for one second yeah. and just enjoy these moments. Absolutely. Yeah. So have you noticed since the 2019 World Cup a shift in the amount or the type of coverage in South Africa about women's football? I must say it has grown a lot, but mainly for the national team, not really in our league just yet. I think the league is just newly launched um, it's, and it's been broadcasted. One game is being broadcasted a week. Um, so we're trying to get that more on different channels as well. But it's baby steps, I guess. I'll take it. But the media coverage more comes from, from the national team when we are active mostly where you you get to hear about you know us and in the national team and then you only get to hear about the league that we're participating in so it still has some a lot of improvements and room to grow over here and what about when you're just out in general kind of talking to people or on the street do you notice that there's more interest in the women's game? Yeah, they are definitely, especially again with the national team. They see me walking in the streets and they recognize me maybe because of my hair, I don't know. And they just talk about the women's national team and how well we are doing and performing and they can't wait for us to qualify for the World Cup. Um, so there's a big hype around the women's game over here, definitely. So soccer, football has obviously done so much for you and you've had these incredible experiences as a leader, as a player. How important do you think it is that young girls all around the world have access to sport? I mean, from leadership to confidence, body image, what do you see sport bringing to young girls in your country? Well, you mentioned one thing and that is confidence. Um, I always say my experiences in school, I was this tomboy. I hated to wear dresses. I was always picked on because I never wore a dress. And I was always picked on because I always looked like a boy. And my hair was always short. And until they found out that I played football and, you know, played football at club level where everyone could see me play and then starting to represent the junior national teams, I kind of got that respect from people. And they didn't really care anymore about my image and who I was and what I looked like um, and what I said, it, it, they were all just, they just respected me for who I was and what I did. Um, and 
in a way it's a wrong thing, but that is because through sports and I was able to express my talents to people, um, you know, I, I kind of got that confidence because everyone was then being treated me well and, and so on. So I think for, for any young athlete it's, or any young person, um, it's important that, you know, you, you take up sports seriously. You learn so many life lessons from sports, you know, how to be disciplined, how to value things around you, how to set standards for yourself, how to act professional, how to make decisions in your life. Because there are many times where we, we as teenagers, we drift, you know, I think teenagers leave the planet at a certain age and then they return because they think <laughs> they know everything. Um, but you don't actually, but at the moment you do. But through sports, it's able to grab hold of you and say, you know, this is what you have. This is what you're good at. This is what you should and shouldn't do. So it teaches you a lot of values and valuable lessons in life as well. So I think it's really important that sport creates this for us. And we need to utilize that not only for our talents, but the lessons that come with it as well. So what do the specifically footballing opportunities look like for young girls in South Africa today compared to how it was for you when you were growing up? Has it changed a lot? Oh, my goodness. It's like chalk and cheese. Like Today I say to the young girls, like, I wish I had what you guys have right now. Because back then we didn't have, you know, the freedom to play. We weren't comfortable in where we played because I grew up playing with boys. I'm, pretty, I'm sure you played with boys as well. Many of us, the older generation played with boys because they were not any female structures um, back in the day. And, you know, being able to sign contracts at 16, 17 years old, you know, and not at 29 when I did. Um, so there's so much more opportunity now. The competition has grown um, in every country. There's at least th two or three different competition, cup competitions. So you play on a regular basis. You grow as a player. And they just take women's football more serious. You're able to actually, you know, make – a living and a career out of something that you love to do, whereas we never used to have that. We never used to have proper development in order to reach that next stage. So, I mean, if we had, I, pro I think, you know, women's football right now would probably be similar to what the men's football is at the moment um, on, on the same level. So, Right, yeah, they've had decades, hundreds of years of more exactly. time and, and investment. So, yeah, they are very, very privileged for what, what they have now compared to back in the day. Um, but I guess everything, every successful story has to start somewhere. So, you know, these kind of girls, for us, we are able to still, you know, tell them about the old days and how things used to be and look like and how privileged and grateful they should be for this opportunity they have right now in this moment. Well, Tell us about the club that you've started and now after, finally, after COVID and a delay, playing for your own club and what that process has been like and, and where you hope the team will go. Well, look, I mean, the JVW is called JVW and a lot of people are still ask, what does JVW stand for? But that's Janine from Vic, my name. I did figure that part out. I think it was just really established because of, the lack of opportunity for girls back in the day. And I think that in 2012, it was still, you know, in between of will women's football go on the rise or, you know, will it just stay stagnant where it is? We never really knew. But I think for me, it was mainly to just give girls an opportunity to play in a comfortable and friendly environment, something that I didn't have growing up playing it was so difficult for me and there's so many girls that I see quit football because of the reasons of the challenges that they face playing with boys and there are so many girls that I identified in the schools that played with boys and they just they don't know where to go elsewhere after school and it's wasted talent for nothing and that is one of the reasons why I you know figured it out and try to to give back and to the game and um, as the national team captain and just making sure that there is a proper structure for women in place. And we started only with 13 players at the club and today we're sitting close to 100 girls participating in the club. So it's wow. grown enormously um, over the years. And yeah, I started playing with my own team. Um, but again, back then it wasn't a semi-professional league. It was just an amateur league and trying to get all these young girls around me and help them, guide them, you know, teach them some things in, in, in football and the way they, they should approach 
you know, life and how they need to approach the game. And then obviously got contracts abroad while the club was still running. Luckily for me, I had a couple of people, friends, teammates, former teammates that, you know, national teammates that retired that helped me out with the club. So it allowed me to actually go and, you know, focus on my career. Um, when I went to the States, I played at Houston, um, then went to Denmark, then to Scotland. Um, and I didn't think I would come back and play with my club, but I was always in between of do I retire? Um, you know, when you reach and you achieve your goals in your career. And for me, it was always the Olympic Games and a World Cup. And I was on the verge of being two minds. Do I retire or, you know, do I um continue to play and after coming back from Scotland then just decided to carry on I think you know I think as an athlete you'll know and realize when the time is and I don't feel that yet I think I can still give more and I hopefully will qualify with the national team for what in in 2023 absolutely so hopefully you'll see me and South Africa over there But yeah, currently just playing for my club team. It sounds so strange, actually, but (laughs) it's just, you know, keeping fit and healthy and being the best that I can be every day. So what was the experience like when you first went abroad to the NWSL and then being in Denmark and in Scotland? What were your different experiences and how do you feel like you were able to maybe bring some of your culture and your experience to those clubs? And then what also did you learn from being at top teams around the world? You know, my first experience abroad came at 29, age 29. Um, That's why I always say to the youngsters, never give up on your dreams because you never know when it's going to come. You know, it doesn't have a a time frame when it's going to happen. And when I went to the NWSL, I was really nervous and um, I was the captain of the national team, the highest cap player in Africa, but you still have that, you know, nerves within you going into a new environment. You're going into one of the best leagues in the world and you have to go and showcase yourself. No one really cared about you being the national team captain or being the highest cap player. It's about showcasing what you are able to do on the field. So I think the first couple of months, it really tested my character. It tested a lot, you know, it made me question myself as a player, like, am I ready for this? Am I good enough for this? I'm not sure I'm able to cope with this. So there were a lot of doubts, but as you find your feet, you know, you actually start to get comfortable. You get to know your teammates, but that is the hardest part coming into a new team and making sure that you are good enough for them, for them to accept you as part of their team. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of energy off the field as well, trying to connect with your teammates. So it was a whole new different ball game for me because, yeah, in South Africa, I was the national team captain. Everyone wanted to be on my team. So going there, it was it was extremely difficult. Um, and then after a while, when I settled in, you know, gained some confidence, got some game time, and then obviously came back in the second year and did much, much better because I was already, you know, set in the environment, knew my surroundings and my teammates. Um, but the game itself in, in the States is very tough. Very, I mean, for me as a player that only trained two, three times with my club team and then only by myself on the other days to come into a full time program and training hard, it was a lot of effort and um, really needed to push. And then being in the gym, something that I wasn't used to doing. Um, that was it was very tough for me, um, you know, because I think Americans, they really they beasts, I must say. Yeah. They are. They can go forever, and it was something that I needed to, you know, keep up with. Um, but I enjoyed myself over there uh, the last year, and I do miss playing at that level most definitely. And got to play against some of the best players in the world, and alongside Harley Lloyd, you know. So um, I've gained that experience, and very happy with it. And then obviously moving to Europe, it was a whole different ball game. I think I was. A little bit more settled because I had played in the NWSL. I knew what it was like. I had experienced the uncomfortable zone, um, you know, coming into a new environment. So it was much easier for me. And I think the culture between the Scottish and the Americans, you know, it's not very easy to to get on with some of the Americans. Uh, they're <laughs> very individualistic. They're very focused on themselves before they worry about anyone else. Whereas in, in Scotland, I think 
they're so welcoming. I mean, from the get go, you know, they yeah, they offer you a beer at the first training session, and you're like, what? No. <laughs> yeah, the the drinking probably helps with the friendliness. The social side of things is much easier in Scotland, <laughs> but yeah, total different ball game on the field there as well. Um, but I think maybe just with my experience and knowing how to settle in a lot quicker helped a lot. But yeah, I think every. Every country had its challenges um, for me that where I played and, yeah, I just, you know, save you every moment that I got and made the best of the experience. So with the national team now, looking ahead to 2023, what are the obstacles that are still in the team's way? What do you think has to be done now to kind of ensure that Banyana Banyana is going to be qualifying for all of the major tournaments and continue to do that? Well, I think the association has really started backing women's football. They've actually now implemented another junior national team, which is good for the development of the program. That's great. Yeah. And um, just continue with the preparations. You know, not so long ago, we played in the Bahari Cup where we faced Nigeria. And Nigeria always used to be our rival team. They always used to beat us 5-6-0. I mean, in the World Cup, you know, Nigeria always went to the World Cup, never South Africa. Um, but where we played them recently, um, we had our internationals come back and you could see the difference in, in their game and how it uplifted the team. And we actually won that because we beat Ghana 3-0 and we beat Nigeria 4-2. Um, so that was the first time in, in our history beating Nigeria by such a large margin in a competition like that. So you can see that, you know, the experience that the players are getting abroad is really helping um, with the team. So we have the African Women's Cup of Nations that make us qualify for a World Cup. So it is a, it's a tournament set up and that will be played next year, September. And the top four teams qualify. And South Africa has never really not qualified for the semifinals of the competition. So we are one of the, the countries that are looking to qualify for the World Cup. So the, that has to be done, of course. Um, and I think it can be done with the kind of players that we have. I think we're looking at the bigger picture is how are we going to get to the round of 16 at the World Cup? And that is our bigger bigger aim and our bigger picture and bigger target for the national team. And of course, we need to focus on now. Um, but realistically, you know, we're also thinking ahead, if we do qualify, what does our preparation look like and um, to get to that? And I think after that, you know, the game will just expand a lot more um, in our country. And hopefully, I mean, right now there's a African Women's Champions League that was launched this year. So there's just competition of the competition for us, which will strengthen the national teams of, you know, the continent, Africa on its own, um, not just, you know, us as South Africans. So there's obviously a lot to be done um, in terms of players, you know, getting professional contracts and so forth. But in terms of competition and preparation, I think we are on, you know, a good road to establish a good name for ourselves in the top competitions. Well, I love that. It's already the mindset just pushing forward. You know, that's the only way I think to do it is, you know, it was such a big deal to qualify, but now it's already, you know, how can you make the round of 16? I think that's such a good way to look at it. That's something that's so important for us as well as New Zealanders. You know, we've qualified a lot, but then we still haven't won a game at a World Cup. So it's kind of, it's never being satisfied. How can we keep pushing and growing and developing? So you may have already answered this, but the final question is, what do you think the legacy of the 2023 Women's World Cup in New Zealand and Australia will be? I think this tournament, this World Cup, would probably be the biggest World Cup in women's football history because women's football is on everyone's tongue at the moment and it's everywhere to be seen. So I think people want to get so involved in this Women's World Cup. They're getting to know the players. The players are out there. And it's not just only in America where people know the Megan Rapinos and Alex Morgans. It's globally. And people want to see that. People want to buy into it. So I think it's probably going to be the best World Cup. And for me personally, I, you know, I've never been to Australia or New Zealand. Really want to go there. 
but just the competition and the level of competition. And I don't think, I mean, you saw in the Olympics, it's not just one or two teams anymore that are the powerhouses of women's football anymore. It's not just your America or your Germany. You know, you have your Sweden coming up, Denmark, Australia. I should say New Zealand because it's you, but Um, not quite, (laughs) but we're trying. (laughs) But, you you know, yeah, anything can happen. Anything can happen. And it's just making everything more interesting. So, yeah, I think just women's football is on the rise. And um, after this World Cup, I think people are going to, sponsors are going to really want to buy into the women's game and just make it a global recognition, you know, sport for everyone. Well, now you've got me super excited about the World Cup. I cannot wait. And I also look so forward to seeing you and your team there. But until then, thank you so much, Janine, for being on the podcast. And hopefully I will see you on the field soon. Yes, we will. Thank you so much. And hope to see you soon. That's all for this episode of the Fief Pro podcast, Changing the Game. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do like, subscribe and review it or maybe share it with a friend. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.